Hello everyone and welcome to today's Physics Daily Blue Stuff. This is number 8 in our Paper 2 series. We're continuing with P6 today, so while it's not explicitly listed on that advanced information, I would still fully expect there to be at least some questions on P6 on your exam papers. What we're going to start off with then is understanding what we mean by the term background radiation. Whenever we talk about background radiation, these are the sources of radiation that we are exposed to all the time, just in everyday life. So you can see the little pie chart there, the different ways that we're exposed to radiation. The overwhelming majority, that 50% there, is going to be radon. Now, radon is a gas that comes from rocks, so naturally occurring. We then come down to our artificial sources. So a lot of these will be through medical uses, you can see tiny, tiny amounts there in terms of nuclear weapons tests and nuclear power. We then come down to our ground and buildings, food and drink, cosmic rays, and then there's a tiny little fraction of other sources that don't fit into the main categories. We do need to know these two key terms and their definitions, because they have had a question in the past asking you to explain these two different terms, contamination and irradiation. When we talk contamination, this is radioactive material inside your body or on the skin. This is problematic for us because what we're looking at here is if this is internal contamination, so you've swallowed some radioactive material, we can't remove that. So that is going to be detrimental to your health in a significant way. Irradiation, however, is when the radioactive material is outside your body, but the radiation it emits can travel inside. The reason that we're concerned about radiation full stop is that when it enters your body, it can damage the DNA inside the cells. Damaged DNA can lead to cancer. If we're only talking about a small dose of radiation, then that damage can be repaired by the body usually. Larger doses, the body just can't cope and therefore it's going to be a much more significant issue for us. We do have a couple of uses of radiation that we need to be aware of here. We've mentioned these previously. First one is medical tracers. So in terms of a medical tracer, this allows us to image things that are going on inside the body without having to carry out any form of surgery. What we do is we use a radioactive isotope, which will be injected, inhaled or swallowed, depending on which part of the body we want to look at. We then use a gamma camera to detect the radiation. So that gamma camera is obviously outside the body and we just pass it over and it detects where there's a greater concentration of the radiation or where radiation just isn't able to get to full stop. One thing we do need to bear in mind about this though is that the radiographers who are responsible for handling these isotopes need to select which one carefully. We do not want something that either has a half-life which is too short or too long. Half-life too short, we're not going to be able to actually detect them properly and get the readings we need to because obviously some half-lives are incredibly short and they'll break down before we can image. Half-life that's too long means we're going to be emitting radiation for a longer period of time than necessary and therefore exposing cells to a greater dose of radiation than needed. We also need to make sure it emits the right type of radiation. You do not want to pick an alpha source because that's not going to be able to penetrate out through the skin to get to the camera at all. And it's going to just be absorbed by all of those cells in the immediate area, causing significant damage. So we need a type of radiation that's actually going to be able to pass out of the body through all the layers of tissue, etc., and be detected by our camera. So there's careful choice there. Second use, the gamma knife. This is what we're going to do to treat cancer. So what we use is a movable source of gamma radiation. And what we're actually going to do is we move that source around the body. So you can see it's basically on a little fixed track. And what we do is we move it around the body because that means it's always going to be focused on the tumor here. But by moving it, it means that the healthy tissue is not going to get a high dose. So if tumor gets a high enough dose to kill it, the healthy cells surrounding the tumour get a lower dose and therefore shouldn't be killed. 
Next up, nuclear fission. When we talk nuclear fission, this is splitting. Okay, so we're going to split a large nucleus into two smaller nuclei and some neutrons. Now, this isn't going to occur spontaneously. If our nucleus absorbs a neutron, then fission is more likely. So generally speaking, if we want to trigger a fission reaction, what we're going to do is fire neutrons so they get absorbed and then it makes the larger nucleus more likely to split into those two small ones. The end result then is our large nucleus here is going to split into these two smaller nuclei and they're then also going to release these three neutrons. Two or three, but remember three is probably easier. Now, what we find is some material is fissionable, which means that we can split it easily. Uranium-235, uranium-239. These are the ones we tend to use in our power stations, because through nuclear power, what we're actually doing is carrying out nuclear fission. So we want something that's fissionable. Therefore, we use uranium-235, uranium-239 for that reason. The reason that we do this then is that when we carry out our nuclear fission, what we're going to also generate is a lot of energy. Now, that energy can be used to heat water, which produces steam, steam drives turbines, turbines turn on generators, generators make the electricity. So through that, what we're actually doing is creating our electricity. Now, what we do need to bear in mind, and the reason that nuclear power stations are quite useful to us, is that when we're looking at the amount of energy that we generate per kilogram of the material, then in our nuclear fission, we get a lot more energy than we do through combustion. So this means we're going to get more bang for your buck, basically. If they ask you about why we use nuclear fuel over combustion, the answer that we're looking for is it generates more energy per kilogram of fuel. Make sure you add in that per kilogram of fuel part. So what we find then, we start off our reaction, single neutron, is going to then join with this larger nuclei, split it into two smaller, and so on, releasing three. They all then go and join the nucleus, then they split, releasing three each. So hopefully what we can see from this little diagram in the bottom right is, from that one nucleus that we've split, what we've then done is generate three neutrons. That will lead to three new nuclei splitting. They are then going to release three neutrons each. This is going to get to be a big reaction quick. And that's what we refer to as a chain reaction. What we do need is enough material around that initial nucleus that's going to split to allow those neutrons to actually then join with the new nuclei. If obviously they're not present, then that can't happen, the reaction would end. What we do need to make sure of in our nuclear power stations is that these chain reactions are controlled. You don't just want an uncontrolled chain reaction going on inside your nuclear power plant. Otherwise, that's going to lead to a meltdown. That's bad news. So what we have are these things called control rods, which basically are just rods that absorb the neutrons. So once the reaction is getting a little bit too vigorous, those rods just lower down into our reaction vessel and absorbs the excess neutrons. If we want the reaction to speed up again, just lift the control rods. So the problems come if those control rods are not obviously raising and lowering as they should do. If we then think about a nuclear bomb, this has no control rods. There is no control of fission full stop. So that means the reaction is just going to continue along that chain, getting larger and larger and larger, generating a huge amount of energy in a short space of time. Second type of reaction, nuclear fusion. This is where two lighter nuclei join together to make a more stable nucleus. This is what happens in the sun. So in our sun, hydrogen nuclei are going to fuse together to form larger ones. Now, we are going to release energy at that point and we will transfer energy from the nuclear store by heating and electromagnetic radiation. And that's what reaches us here on Earth, that electromagnetic radiation from the sun. The reason that we can't use nuclear fusion as a way to generate electricity here on Earth, because it generates more energy than nuclear fission, is because we've got a problem getting those nuclei to attract close enough. 
because they're both positively charged. Therefore, as those nuclei get close enough, they just repel each other. So in order to actually bring about fusion, we've got to have a way to make those fuse, and that's not really easy to do. The reason that fusion can occur in the sun is because it's got incredibly high temperatures, and therefore that means the nuclei move much faster, and high pressures, which forces the nuclei close enough for fusion to occur. To generate those same temperatures and pressures here on Earth is not really feasible. So this is why we've not managed to do this yet. In terms of what we generate through fusion in our stars, then iron will be the heaviest element we can make in that way. Because we do have elements heavier than iron that exist, they came into existence as the result of a supernova. And we'll recap on what that is when we do P8. Last thing that we're going to look at today is this idea of E equals MC squared. So there's probably one sort of scientific formula everyone knows is that one. Now, what we're looking at here is the mass of our products of our fusion is slightly less than the mass of the reactants. Now, what we find is by using this E equals MC squared, that tiny change in mass actually produces a huge amount of energy. Look at the equation, we can see why. OK, so E is just our energy in joules. Delta just means a change and it's the change in mass. Now, change in mass in kilograms, but we're multiplying that tiny change in mass by the speed of light squared. So the speed of light is 300 million meters per second. And we're going to square that before we multiply it by the change in mass. So even a small change in mass is going to lead to a huge amount of energy. If there are bits you'd like to look at in more detail from today's booster, then do use the P6 playlist over on the channel, your revision guides, and have a look at some of those past exam papers to get a bit of a feel for what could come up. Don't forget to join us as well for our next Physics Daily Booster tomorrow.